Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today, and welcome to this Auto Vitals TV webcast series broadcast, Turning Searches into Customers. I'm Patrick Egan, publisher of Auto Vitals TV, and I'll be your moderator today for this webcast. Well, let me introduce you to our panelists. Larry Morris, a co-owner and operator of Larry's Auto Works, a $2 million a year automotive maintenance and repair center serving the Mountain View, California area for over 41 years. He's been a past state president for the Automotive Service Councils of California, or ASCCA. He's co-founder of QuickTrack Software, a patented web-based product productivity improvement program for automotive service centers. It's also used by other service-based small businesses as well. He's been a developer of incentive pay and scorekeeping systems for service sector businesses, and a recipient of many local, regional, state, and national environmental awards for waste reduction in automotive service business. Well, thanks for joining us today, Larry. Also joining us shortly is Uwe Kleinschmidt. Uwe is the CEO and founder of Auto Vitals. He's passionate about building solutions for the independent automotive shop owner to succeed in the modern internet era. Prior to Auto Vitals, Uwe spent over 15 years with Robert Bosch in a variety of positions around the globe, building software to master the transition to highly computerized cars. Uva is also the holder of multiple patents and is an Ironman finisher. Well, welcome, guys. Welcome, Uva. Welcome, Larry. Thank Good you, morning. Patrick. Well, um, if you're ready to go there, Uva, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm super excited um, that we do this um, first time Auto Vitals webcast with that uh, audience. Um, I hope. And I'm almost certain you, you're going to spend your time and get value out of it. Um, you all know the Internet is really changing at a pace we barely can keep up with. And Auto Vitals made it its mission to use anything the Internet has to offer to help independent shop owners to leverage it um, in the interaction with the motorist. So that's why our tagline is motorist interaction has moved online, have you? So you know all those numbers, how many smartphones are out there, everything in the millions, tablets, proliferation. Motorists are on the web anywhere and anytime. So the question is what opportunities does a shop have in the internet age to utilize and leverage the internet to interact with motorists. Boom, we have four things at least. So if you look at the different phases in the shop, uh, it starts with new customers. We can say from our research up to 3,500 searches happen per month for auto, uh, auto repair services. And that's in a town of about 60,000 um, in uh, population. But it doesn't stop there. You can use the internet to uh, meet the challenge at selling an inspection result or an estimate to the customer, for example, where most of the shops uh, still use the phone only. And you, you probably agree with me uh, how challenging but also rewarding that is. Um, if the customer interaction works, the internet can help um, really amplify those results. We talked about mobile devices already a little bit in the customer retention, social networks, the ability to reach motorists on their phone um, is so obvious, but today we don't have enough time to really cover all those four topics. So all we are going to do in this webcast, first part of a series, is focus on what does the search experience look like, the motorist is going through, and what aspects are really important beyond what we already know, which is be on page number one. So the focus of, of this webcast is going through the steps a, a motorist goes through using online search and go please to the next slide. How can we make sure that the search result turns into a customer? 
just to illustrate two different approaches, um, you see here a not fully optimized approach and a fully optimized approach. On the left hand side, the same amount of searches, in this case maybe 3500, turns into one customer. On the right hand side, it turns into 29. That's a remarkable difference and looking at this graph right now, it's totally unclear where the difference might be. Um, the number of searches is the same, so why come that the number of customers is so different? And what you see here is the typical sales funnel. So you can see that the steps turning a search into a customer goes through finding the listing and the website, visit the landing page, engage on the website, contact the shop, and then the service advisor normally creates if you want a customer. So it's all about conversion. And what we're going to do in the next uh, few minutes is go through every single step and, and find out what this fully optimized web experience uh, does better than the not so fully optimized to get this higher amount of customers. Let's start with find the listing and website. It's really important to imagine how long this experience takes because that determines what a human can actually digest and process. Please keep that in mind. Um, so it takes about five to ten seconds and you guessed it already. The goal has to be be as often as possible on page number one so searching motorists find it, um, do their first, get their first impression and click on the link. And so you see several um, really important factors and measures which need to be taken to be fully optimized. The first one is, everybody knows it, your business directory listing, especially in Google with 75 searches, still the absolute leader in that space, and your website is so optimized that it shows up on page number one. Seems to be a no-brainer, hard to do, but um, we who, who are in the business of helping you do exactly this. Um, in addition, you want to try to promote your specialties, if possible, with reputation information. And you also want to create a different way of getting reputation from third-party vendors, just like Yelp, City Search, and so on. You can use the reviews for SEO, and you have YouTube videos. When I say reviews for SEO, then SEO stands for search engine optimization. It means make Google aware that your reviews are not only there for reputation, but also have value to add another element on page number one to be visible. Here's one example for what I mean with promote specialties with five-star rating. Why specialties? Why is that important? It's really clear somebody who drives a car and looks for a specialist um, doesn't have enough time and doesn't even go to a generalist or a website promoted as a generalist. If you drive a BMW, you prefer the BMW specialist. So in this case, you see here a all makes all models shop with more than one specialty under one roof and promote it as a European specialist, including the five-star rating together with the Google Places listing. Here you see an example how a review can be used. Uh, this is an additional showing of the business on page number one where a review given by a satisfied customer who happens to drive the same car and lives in the same town as the uh, search keyword suggests is picked up by Google and featured on page number one. So you see 
there are several additional measures uh, to be taken to really try to dominate page number one and be as often as possible on page number one. We are now on the landing page. The landing page is not necessarily the home page, especially if you promote more than one specialty. You might want to think about creating a website which already takes the knowledge about the search from the customer into account and doesn't show them information the customer has not searched for. That's why web presences which know that take that into account and show a different landing page depending on the search are mostly successful. And let me introduce what we call an engagement score, which is simply the number of hits to that landing page and in ratio to the number of clicks. In other words, people go there, find something interesting, and since you want to engage on the, on the landing page, a click is a great measure on whether or not they get engaged. Let's compare the two um, approaches again. Both have to have a clean professional design, there is no doubt about it. Um, there is still a, a school of thought out there which says on the landing, especially your home page, put as much information on it as possible so the visitor can take as much knowledge home as possible. Not a good idea. Um, remember this step takes 5 to 15 seconds. If you need two minutes to get oriented on the page, it takes too long. People bounce. That's what the web guys call it. You bounce off the website and go to a different search. Um, in addition, other websites try to put big images, slideshows, videos, lots of menu items. So it's really following this idea, if I just put everything out there, it helps SEO and people know exactly what I'm doing. To digest that in 5 to 15 seconds is, is impossible. So think about this. Um, just imagine um, yourself if you go to a website for a service uh, and get really fire host with information, whether that's a good user experience or not. Um, we believe the owner and the business should be introduced. A good landing page is a good representation of what the business is in real life, right? And you deal with people. So the service advisor, shop owner, and so on should ideally introduce the business. Another one is to promote appointment requests. Now you're going to say, of course, that's the goal of the whole thing. Yes, I agree. It is. But just imagine you go into a mall you, you've never been to, you want to buy a pair of shoes, and the guy from the shoe store jumps at you with a pair in his hands and says, buy it. Would you do it? No, of course not. So if you're too early with jumping with the appointment request, then, then it's just not effective. And it's another uh, thing to digest on the home page or landing page, which at this point in the process has no value. And remember, I'm talking about new visitors, not existing customers. But existing customers have time. For them, the 5 to 15 second rule doesn't apply. This is all about new customers. So typically, engagement scores for those two approaches are like 50% or 100 or more percent for the fully optimized. Let me, let me show you um, two examples. Next, please. So you see here two different uh, web pages, home pages uh, of two different websites. And you probably agree with me that the one on the left-hand side is well designed. It looks nice and clean. It's really, it's really good. So on the right-hand side, there's more the quirky humor of the owner, uh, the owner himself, and, and information. So let's compare the engagement scores for both. 
So what you see here is you probably have to um, zoom in a little. Um, this is a so-called heat map technology that allows us to find out where people click. And um, it also allows us to determine the engagement score. And you see that the, that the left-hand side picture has an engagement score which is uh, 50, a little bit over 50%, whereas the down below has almost 100%. So you see it's not always about how it looks. And to make another case here, do me a favor, go to Amazon.com and tell me whether that has a pretty look. It doesn't. But believe me, Amazon, which is in the business of converting people into purchases or new time visitor into purchases, spend millions on finding out what works and what doesn't. So what we're trying to do is basically um, applying the same technology um, as e-commerce websites to small businesses, in this case independent auto repair shop businesses, to make a website effective. Now you can start breathing. We are on the website. The first two hurdles are taken. Both were between 5 and 10 or 15 seconds, if you remember. And now you have engaged your visitor. Now you have, in web terms, all the time of the world. Because engaging on the website takes up to two and a half minutes. Right? So now you can think what the other pages of your website should offer. What is the information a first-time visitor is looking for? And time is now not of such a concern anymore because you have them engaged. Right? So I like to summarize that in the landing page is your elevator speech. So, you know, you are in some, with somebody in the elevator, you have 10 seconds, now tell them about you in 10 seconds, whereas the website is your resume. And really important findings are um, tell the visitor about you. It's a local business in a local community. Um, show them why you are where you are and what you do outside of your business because that is what connects people. Logging on social network also should be engaging. Be very careful with too many promotional messages. The second biggest reason why people unlike Facebook pages is too many promotional messages. Right? So it's, it's hard to do, but um, keep that in mind. Um, Try a low hurdle appointment request. What does it mean? The not so fully optimized approach is very natural thinking. I don't know those people. They should give me as much information as possible on my website so I know so much that my return call or email back can really be precise. Not a good idea because remember there's not much time available. How many people are reading all this on a website? Um, not many. So think of it as getting the lead, getting only information which helps you to reach back out and then do the personal engagement. The same with education. If the education is generic, it's better than no education. But if you can personalize it and make clear it comes from you as the expert in your trade, much better. Much better. Let's, let's summarize. Before the contact to your service advisor happen, those three steps um, need to be taken into account when designing the whole web presence. Dominate page number one to increase the impressions and hits to the website. Create an effective landing page to increase the engagement score and make the website your resume to the visitor to increase the number of contacts to the shop. So this funnel has four steps. The fourth one is your service advisor. And the, the more uh, hits or 
uh, contacts you have in the step before, the better. So every single step is important in that funnel. Okay, I hope that was um, interesting and I'm, I'm ready to go for, for questions. Uh, that would be awesome if we can engage in a, in a, in a great discussion. So fire Uber, away, please. Uber, can I make a couple comments on there? Sure. Okay, the whole idea of the general versus specialty shop that you do is works amazingly well. The numbers that I have show that in the average, a good general repair shop has an average ticket of about 2.7 hours. That's a good one. A good specialty shop has an average ticket of about 3.6 hours. So getting customers coming through from a specialized um, location of your shop on the Internet greatly increases the odds that it's going to be a bigger ticket when they actually come in. So that, that, that methodology works. Yes, and I have to add that even Google prefers specialists, right? Which makes certain sense right. if you look at the search experience of a visitor, specialists seem to be preferred. Not only in the common sense, but Google is trying to adapt that common sense in their uh, algorithm to push uh, businesses on page number one. Alrighty. Well, thanks, you guys. Uh, thanks, Uva. Um, so before we get going here, uh, don't forget, everyone, to use that uh, question box you can see over on the side there to type your questions. Uh, we have quite a few that have come in already. But uh, before we get going, I'd also like to uh, prompt you with a poll. So we'd like to know uh, what your role is in the shop. So just so we get an idea of, of who all is participating in the webcast today, just go ahead and select one of those, whether it's shop owner, service advisor, technician, or other, and then just click the Submit button. And I'll wait a few moments while everyone selects their options. 85% people have selected already. Alrighty. Okay, it looks like we have about a little over 80% are shop owners, 16% are other, and 3% are service advisors. Great, so we got a good idea of, of, of who all is here today. I'm going to close the poll. Okay, so as we get going, um, boy, we have a lot of people really interested in that heat map. And uh, so, uh, you know, how, how does someone get a heat map on their website? You know, how, how does, what's the process of doing that? Um, a heat map is an accepted technology. There are different vendors out there. Uh, all it takes is um, get a little JavaScript snippet, you know, 10 lines of code, and put that on the page you want to have the heat map from. So either you go to your web designer and do it, um, or you do it yourself. It's really a half a minute effort and then you get great results. Not only where people click, you also see how, what's the scroll behavior. Is your upper part of the website even seen by the visitor? If you have a lot of information there, you want to know, right? So um, we are happy to do that uh, for you. Um, so contact us or ask your web designer to put a heat map uh, on your website. Great, great. So here's another question for you, Uva. Um, so um, let's see, uh, people are asking uh, where they can get a copy of the slideshow. And again, uh, I posted the link to get the slideshow over there in the uh, question box. So if you uh, need that again, or if you didn't see it, let me know. I'll just post a question again, we'll, we'll uh, post that for you. Also, uh, another person is asking, um, if you already have a website, do you recommend redoing it or just adding a landing page? Huh. Tough question. And actually, you know, looking at the website, I would, I would say you should run the heat map first on your website and then make that decision whether we're doing it. And, and always add a landing page. But the landing page is not an isolated piece on your website. It should, you know, be integrated and 
Um, so run the heat map, look at the, at the results, maybe together with us, and then draw the right conclusions about redesigning it or not, and then take that design, which is successful, and apply it to the landing page. All righty. Uh, another question, too, that's kind of a follow-up to that. So um, back in your presentation, talking about landing pages, so can you explain again the difference between what you mean between a landing page and a home page? Okay, the home page is normally the domain of your of your website, like myautorepairshop.com is is the home page. A landing page is myautorepairshop.com slash Toyota Repair, right? For example, so it's a sub page. It's one page of your website, but you promote it. Uh, especially, so if somebody types in, I don't know, Toyota Repair Santa Barbara, they don't land at your homepage because the homepage is not Toyota specific. They land at your landing page, that's why the name. And so the immediate experience is about Toyota, not about what's on your homepage. I hope that it makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah, let, let me add to that a little bit from a, from a user's perspective, a little less technical. Uh, you know, if I'm a guy looking for somebody to fix my Toyota, and I need to be able, I want to know that they're going to be competent, they're going to know what they're doing. If they're Toyota specialists, I don't have to question, in theory, whether or not they know how to work on my car. So if I land on a page for Toyota, my question's already answered. Yeah, these are the people I want to talk to. If I land on a general page that says one of the cars we work on is Toyota, what happens many times is their mind goes, oh, this is a general repair shop. I want somebody who knows Toyota. So that's why the landing page is so effective at getting people to pick up that phone and call or to, to respond to you. Thanks, Larry. Hey, so um, question for you too, Larry. What's, what's been your uh, success with, um, with getting people to call you uh, based on using the, the uh, um, the internet as far as where you appear on page one and, and how that whole process goes. What's what's how have you found the conversion rate to to work at your shop? Well, the conversion rate is really good. I, I, and I think you have to speak to quality as much as quantity. I, I just before this brought this uh, uh, webcast just quickly ran my numbers and it looks like uh, in the last year I have gained hundred and thirty six new customers who spent Seventy-eight thousand dollars with me on their first visit, and I can go into the later visit. I can tell you that that's a significant improvement over what I was getting before my pages were optimized. More importantly, eighty percent of the call, eighty percent of the calls we get convert because we're already what they're looking for. They've already landed. They've seen we're what they're looking for. We don't have to go into a big sales pitch to get them to come in what we really have to do is not make any mistakes about disqualifying ourselves so that they want to come in and visit us and bring their car in. So, you know, the, the, the important thing is, is, is really what Uwe has been saying, it's conversion rates. It's, it's not total numbers, it's how many of the numbers you get actually end up with the car in the shop. And how that's approached and how that is done is significantly, makes a significant difference in the results you get. All right, cool. Thanks. Can I, can, I, can I ask a question, Patrick? Sure. For Larry? So, Larry, if you look back before the Internet presence and before the whole um, influx of new customers, what's the change your service advisors had to do on the phone through through Internet, if there is any? In terms of new customers, um, it, what it really meant is I didn't have to make huge changes on the phone because we had already, in, in our other advertising, our non-internet advertising, we had already sort of optimized it in terms of trying to focus on particular types of people to call us. Originally, when I was trying to advertise on the internet myself, trying to learn how to do it, we were having to try to, we were spending a lot more time with calls that were what I'll call bogus phone calls. These were people who we were, we go, why did they even call us? With the optimized pages and with things working that way, 
it's clear why people are on the phone with this, and it makes our job much easier in terms of talking with them and booking that appointment and, and not having to spend a long time on the phone with them because we've already moved to a level of, a level of trust by what they've seen so far on the Internet. So it has, it has actually simplified our work on the phone because of Interesting. that. Interesting. Thank you. So here's another follow-up question to uh, landing pages. And one of our viewers wants to know, can you have more than one landing page that's targeting a specific search? And if not, why not? Yes, you can. But um, it's not a an algorithm you can easily apply. Oh, I'm doing 20 specialties to 20 landing pages. There is no um, particular rule. It depends on many, many, many different things on your location, on the specialty you want to promote. Um, unfortunately, if it was easy, I, I could tell you, but it's not. It, it depends on a, in a consultation um, in where you live and, and is there a lot of population in your 10-mile radius and all those specialty highly competitive on the web. So you can imagine Porsche repair is not competitive at all, whereas auto repair is a as a search is extremely competitive and um, or brake repair is extremely competitive so you depending on what specialties you offer um, I vote for a custom design or a, of the uh, search strategy but you can do more than one you can do two three four something in that neighborhood but then um, it really, really, really depends on on what you want to do because in the end, let's assume you have 20. You look to Google and to the to the visitor of the website in an odd way. Right? Or just imagine that user experience. Right? You have 20 links to 20 specialties, and and so Google doesn't even know. Are you still a specialist for what? For everything? I mean, this is this is weird, right? So. Um, Pick the ones which really make a difference and take it from there. Yeah, I think you have to get in, you know, to really answer that question, you have to think it like, you have to think like a consumer. Yes. Um, you, you know, if I'm a, if, let's take Porsche. If I'm a Porsche owner and I see that somebody worked on Porsches and Subarus, let's say, in my mind, does that make that a place I'd want to go or not go? If I really value my Porsche and want to make sure they work on it. I don't know. I mean, those are, but those are the kind of questions you have to ask. Can I be Porsche, VW, and Audi? Well, maybe they're all German cars. Maybe I could have landing. Maybe I could group those together. So a lot of it really does have to do with getting into the mind of the person who's doing that search and saying, does this make sense? If I were to see this on a page, or if I were to go explore the rest of the website and find these things, would this solidify or hurt my belief that this was a shop that I wanted to take my car to. Very well put. Thank you. Hey, so we have a, a few people asking about mobile, and that's actually going to be the topic of our next webcast. But um, uh, So have you guys got any stats on, on how many people are actually doing searches in mobile today, and, and what's, what's the, uh, the trend where it's going uh, towards focusing on mobile for, for searches in auto repair? I mean, there's no doubt. Um, I don't know what was the first time when we started measuring it. It's probably 18 months ago or two years ago when we looked up um, hits to the website from a mobile device. And we were on average in the 12, 13 percentile um, range. and 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 then it started skyrocketing. I mean, skyrocketing in the sense of high increase. Um, interestingly, you could even see that in an area like Larry is in Mountain View, Silicon Valley, right? I mean, no doubt what's going to happen there. So we are right now at 32% in that area of, of the web hits coming from a mobile device. But even in other areas, it went up to 18, 25%. Um, that is too big to be ignored, right? So, um, 
Same applies in terms of user experience. You just have a lot less space available. You don't want to have the customer zooming in and zooming out and navigating. Remember I said on one of those slides, um, some websites try to put everything on the home page, especially with a lot of menus at menu items, right? Doesn't work on mobile. You have to be really smart and identify the things people look first. The nice thing about it is tapping the phone number calls the shop, tapping the address shows you where it's located. All the nice things which are not as easy on, on a website should be utilized and leveraged. But yes, you cannot ignore mobile. I mean, the, that's a big mistake. Yeah, I, I've been amazed. You know, As you know, I didn't even know you had turned our mobile on yet. And I had a customer walk in our front door with his phone in hand saying, uh, yeah, I just I was driving by and I needed uh, my car's overheating, um, and I've got you here. And I, I was like, how did you find us on your mobile? And I called Uva and said, uh, you know, did you already turn the mobile on? Oh yeah, we've already turned it on. I mean, it was that quick. I was just amazed. We still don't have stats yet because we're still working on how to measure that and clarify. But um, we've already seen that definitely mobile is something we have to be involved with. That's well, a good question too. As long as I may mm -hmm. chime in, is um, mobile for we are talking right now just mobile for new customers, right? right. Mobile for existing customers is another thing. And, and as Patrick said, uh, we have a whole we we want a uh, a whole segment about this user experience on a on a smartphone is different than on a website and. Um, so I just want to make sure there's sometimes a discussion out there, mobile app versus mobile website, what is better or worse, that's the wrong discussion. It really depends on what do you want to achieve, what, what audience do you target, and how rich can you make the user experience. When I say rich is you all know a text message has 140 characters, what can you pack into 140 characters if you have a richer experience on the, on the phone possible, right? So they're all technologies at work and it changes almost every month. Um, there is a place for a mobile website, there's a place for the mobile app depending on the audience. And I would love to talk about this um, in the next segment. Well, that's great. The, so, you know, uh, going back to landing pages, uh, there's a couple people asking about, about AdWords as well. And so, um, let's talk a little bit about that. So how do AdWords drive the potential customer to a specific landing page and, and what's the process there? Or what should um, be the process? Yeah, there's no difference. I mean, if you really, if we're just assuming AdWords is a viable option to, tra to drive traffic, which is another topic, whether that's true and to what degree and so on. But other than that, um, you should actually use AdWords to run campaigns which land at the landing page. That, that's, I mean, it's a beautiful design. So I just give you an example. Uh, Earth Day couple free brake pads, right, half the price. Run an AdWords campaign about it and let that AdWords campaign land on a landing page which does exactly that advertising, right? It, it, it doesn't get better than this. It's a temporary one. You can take it off. You can even use AdWords campaigns to put tracking phone numbers on it because there are technologies out there where if you know already tracking phone numbers are frowned upon by Google because the phone number, if they find it on the website, doesn't match what's in the Google Places listing. So Google thinks, whoops, that doesn't match, so what's going on? Your ranking drops. But with technology, uh, we have available, you can basically create tracking phone numbers in your AdWords campaign, measure success of that campaign for a very particular laser sharp narrow down approach for one particular campaign you want to run. That's a beautiful way of measuring um, success and then optimizing. Uh, is that campaign successful? Let's do it again. Or if not, why is it not successful? Look at the numbers and try something else, right? It's all, the web is all test and modify, right? 
and the beauty about this is you can measure everything, almost everything, if you do it right. Especially if you have a tracking phone number Google cannot detect and still thinks your website is has the old phone number, but the person who is looking at it doesn't see the old phone number, it sees the tracking phone number. That's how that technology works. So short answer, do it. AdWords is especially um, um, well suited for specific campaigns you want to run. So Larry, have you done any uh, any any work with AdWords uh, for your shop? Actually, uh, yes, I have uh, AdWords that are being run all the time for me. That's being managed by uh, Uva, actually, um, and we've actually reduced that a little bit from what it was originally. We were spending some money and we weren't getting the, the results back, so we've tried to find that uh, sort of optimized level where we're we're spending enough to get some additional results but not spending additional money and not getting results. So that's been a sort of a balancing act back and forth. Um, I do think that they bring in um, you know, a percentage of the customers. Um, but it's really our main focus is not on AdWords. It's on optimizing the, uh, the general searches that come through. All right. So, so Uva, going back to um, something you talked about in the beginning of the presentation, and um, people asking about you know the differences between the the pretty home pages and ones that look homemade. And so, what's the um, why does one work better than the other? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, let me try to start with if you were a Hollywood studio and want to promote a new video, your website would probably look like the Hollywood studio websites look like, right? They don't look like anything like an auto repair shop's website. Why am I saying that? Because it's obvious. It, it all depends on what the audience is looking for and resonate with. Amazon.com looks different than an auto repair shop website and a Hollywood studio website, right? So if you, and I would even um, go out on a limb and say if you are a smart check specialist or you are a Mercedes independent repair specialist, your website should look different. Because depending on what the audience is looking for, that is what they are expecting and that is how they develop their trust. Pretty picture websites have a tendency of being generic, right? Um, because it's pretty pictures. Um, yes, you can do pretty pictures of the owner and the, and the shop, so you have to invest some money. Then I have nothing against pretty pictures. But thinking, let's go to iStock.com, download some, search for auto repair, download some pretty pictures, put them on the website, in our experience, doesn't work. The engagement score is low. Um, and that's all I can say at this point, right? So homemade might sound, oh, that's not a good quality of the website. But if you believe the engagement score, that is maybe what customers who bring in their car are looking for. They look for a trusted local business and which, which radiates exactly that impression they want to see before they engage, right? And um, if we have that in mind, I think we, we find a reason. So, so maybe it's less about pretty pictures if it's pretty pictures and generic and it's tons of slideshows and when you click on it nothing happens, it's just there for show and takes the most precious real estate of the website, then you're in trouble because that's not what they're looking for, the visitor. Yeah, and I, go ahead. I, always like, I always like to frame that in, in very simple terms. Uh, what you're saying is absolutely true and it's true because when we're doing our marketing, marketing is like fishing. What you want to do is catch a particular fish. 
the bait you use is advertising and is the various aspects of advertising. If you want trout, you don't drop bait and you don't drop a lead weight in the middle of the ocean and try to find trout. You go to a you go to a, a, a river. I mean, you go to a creek. You go to a, a place where trout are going to be, and you use fly fish or whatever. I'm not a fisherman in that respect, but you you've got to be appropriate. If your web page is not attractive to the fish you're looking for, they're not going to bite. So you need to know your customer. You need to know what am I looking for? Am I looking for the owner of a particular kind of car who has a who, who wants to feel good about where they take that car? Am I looking for local community people who support Little League? And I know that Little League parents are, are good customers for me. You have to know that question first to answer that, or the answer to that question before you can honestly answer what the web page needs to look like. There are some things that don't work, obviously, and there are some things that are different. The question is, what, what are you looking for as a shop for a customer, and is that page likely to appeal to them? I, I don't know if that simplifies it or not, but that, that's how I look at it. Thank you. Uh, let me add one more thing. We believe you are successful if a website visitor becoming a first-time customer comes to your shop and has the feeling they know you already because the website made that happen. Yeah. <laughs> We've got um, another question here about um, appointment pages, but you know, before we do that, um, I actually have a, a similar poll, and so people are asking, you know, how they should go about creating their appointment page and what should be on it. So let's turn that around. I'd like to ask everyone, um, how do you design an appointment request on your website if you have one already? And are, do you have a web designer who came up with something? Are you trying to get as much information about the vehicle as, and the problem as possible? Um, or you just get contact information so you can reach out. So go ahead and select one of those real quick. And um, I think this is a, a really important topic. And while we're waiting for that, actually, um, so Uva and Larry, what is your perspective? How do you feel um, uh, an appointment page ought to be formatted? What types of information should people get out? Get, get up well, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I really <laughs> want to get the person on the phone. I know that if I can get that person on the phone, I can, I can work with them and find out what they're looking for and then be able to decide if it's something we can provide and then find the best way to let them understand that. So what's most important to me is I want them to either send me an email, or preferably send me an email that I can call them or that I have a number that I can call them at for whatever reason. Um, so being an old-fashioned kind of guy, I like the phone thing. So for me, the most important thing is I want a phone number. I want to know a way I can reach them. That's all I need to know. So then what would be the problem with going in and getting as much information as you can, you know, finding out everything about their car, mileage, make, model, color, what color the seats are, that kind of stuff? Well, I, what I know <laughs> is that the longer it takes me to do something, the less likely I am to do it. So I think if, if I can get one piece of information and get him to hit send uh, right away, the odds go up that it's going to work there. The more information that I have to get from him, although it might help me, it's going to make it, I think, less likely that they're going to do it. People on the Internet are usually in a hurry. They're, they're moving fast. The more information they have to get, the less likely it is. And, and frankly, the information that when we've gotten a lot of information, it's usually incorrect information anyway. So, sure. again, I go with less is better. I tend to agree. I think that uh, the more the more questions you ask people in a form, uh, when all they really want to do is just get a hold of you, is is probably going to turn them off and more likely to make them not press that submit button anyways. So let's check, let's check out our poll here. It uh, looks like about 53% said that their web designer just came up with something. And 11% uh, try to get as much information as possible about the vehicle. And... Um, 35% agree with us and say that, uh, yeah, let's just get the contact information so that we can reach out right away. So I'm going to close that poll. I don't know if we can push it out and let you see. No. Nope. I would like to add another um, fact. Most of the appointments are made on the web um, after hours and on Sundays. And if you basically rely 
solely on the web to have everybody uh, uh, have the person give you all information, the chance that you get it is slim, very slim. Um, so, so we believe the most effective way is thinking about this as a two-step process. The first step is get the lead, get the contact information. The second step is initiated by you and whether that's email or phone, uh, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, you know, the younger crowd is so comfortable with email that they might not want to even call. It depends on the on the job to be done. Is it? Do they have a lot of questions? Is the job something uh, which is clear from the beginning? I mean, it, it, there are really different factors. But forcing people on the requ uh, request appointment form to type in, we have seen websites with VIN number fields. Uh, I don't know how how that should work. I go to my callback and write up the 17 digits to, to make an appointment. That's an extreme. But also forcing them to put in an email address and a phone number and as much information about the problem and so on is tricky. I, I get the attempt to get as much information as possible and it would be lovely and nice if it worked. In our experience, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. Two-step process get the lead, confirm the communication, and then reach out. And I also, having said what I did about being an old-fashioned guy, I luckily have somebody working for me who is very much younger and much more comfortable on the Internet. And when we get uh, queries through that are Internet-based and they want to speak by email, then I turn it over to her, and she does an excellent job there. It's just not my style, so I prefer the phone. Sure. It's probably the, the ideal situation. All right, well, we're just about out of time, and um, I actually have one follow-up question to this because I think it's this is a, a good question as well, too. So what about uh, a live chat? So the, the instant extension of Contact Us, um, how do you it. feel about doing that? Love it. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess, Larry, if I may start from a te technology geek perspective and and my now using my experience with chat, amazing immediate reaction, right? Our discussions with with shops show that would require a person who does nothing else than waiting for a chat, right? So the interrupt-driven character or uh, a profile of the work um, does not really allow for a lot of time spent on waiting for a chat to come through. Is that a good way to put it, Larry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, luckily I have someone who does spend a lot of her time in front of a computer doing various things. So for her, the chats or the email base work um, because we have someone who we can devote to that. Uh, I, I agree totally. If I had to interrupt every time I was doing something to go in and, and stay online with a chat, for me, it just would not work. All righty, guys. Well, thanks. Uh, looks like we are running rapidly out of time. And um, before we go, Uva and Larry, is there one final thought you'd like to leave our audience before we go? Larry, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about a final thought. Um, you know, I just have to say that when I originally started, I considered myself a fairly knowledgeable person about the concept of marketing. And so I thought I was going to master this whole Internet thing several years ago and started learning and reading and trying to stay on top of it and found myself spending a lot of money and getting uh, not very good results, even though I was working with what I thought was the best information from all the experts. I think the big thing that I missed and the thing that I didn't know how to do was how to integrate it, how to make it all work together and, and, and lay on top so that one part supports the other. In fact, I think Uva can attest to this. At one point, I messed it up so bad that I was basically off Google because the information I had in one place didn't agree with information in another place. So Google just said, that's it. We don't know, we don't know what's right. We're just going to take you off. You're not going to be in any search. So I really appreciate the fact that there is 
people out there who make it their business to understand how to do that and integrate it and make it so that, that I no longer am pulled off of Google and uh, get no phone calls at all from it. That would be my final thought. <laughs> Thank you. My final thought is um, I would love to get as much feedback as possible from the audience on what we're doing with this webcast. Is that of value? Um, use our website to subscribe. You get new information every week. Um, how can we, although I consider myself knowing automotive a little bit, how can we make our solution uh, fit the needs and how can we help really be, uh, make you su successful? So I want to engage as much as, as much as possible and the website is really the best place to do that. So if you could use it and are not afraid of asking questions and putting your opinions uh, there, I'd really appreciate that. Well, thanks, Uva. And uh, I want to note to everyone, I just pushed the link out uh, in the questions box uh, where you can find more information about heat mapping and to find out if you are engaged and if you want to uh, get more information about how we can help you get engaged. Well, thanks, uh, Uva and Larry, for joining me today. It's been a great presentation. Uh, Thank welcome. you, Patrick, for, yeah. for, for helping us navigating through it. Larry, I'm really grateful that you had the time to join. It was really, really valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, if you'd like more information about Auto Vitals and Auto Vitals TV, just go to autovitals.com. And thanks for everyone who attended and helped make this presentation a success. And this has been a production of Auto Vitals TV. Goodbye, everyone.